Okay. All right, I got it. So, uh, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Juan Carlos Lopez. I am the Director of Teaching and Learning for the Maple League of Universities. I am coming to you from Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. When I say that, I say that as my compromise to learn, to listen, and listen and listen. And like a very dear colleague of me of mine says, you know, listen and listen. And when you are done listening, go again and listen and listen some more so that we learn and we learn about the truth. And in learning the truth, uh, we're uh, walking towards uh, uh, decolonization and reconciliation uh, following the the the, guy, uh, the the guiding principles of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. I would also like to acknowledge that uh, uh, these lands where I'm a, an immigrant and a settler uh, have also had uh, several waves of uh, people of African descent who have come to these lands and the, the oldest record is, you know, more than 400 years old. And I say that with the same spirit of, of listening and listening and listening some more and then learning and moving towards a, a better future for everyone. So um, with that, I'm gonna, uh, uh, today we, ha we have a very special guest and, and I'm really, really uh, over the moon uh, to have been able to arrange this. And we, we it had many months in the coming, so we, we were able to, to do it. And uh, so n normally I, I do a quick introduction, but today, you know, our special guest, uh, uh, also has a special uh, person introducing her, and that's Dr. Ravindra Chalangain, and he's uh, 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 here at Acadia University, and I'm gonna let uh, Ravindra introduce Glenda. So take it away, Ravindra. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Hello, everyone. My name is Ravindra Chalangain. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at Acadia University. I'm honored to have this opportunity to introduce my PhD co-supervisor, Professor Glenda Bonifacio, to you today. Dr. Bonifacio is the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Lakehead University in Ontario. Dr. Bonifacio taught at the University of Lethbridge for more than 17 years in the Department of Women and Gender Studies and established her research programs in various areas such as gender, migration, disaster before she joined Lakehead University in November 2023. She's an internationally renowned scholar with a broader intellectual network and research collaboration. Dr. Bonifacio is the author of almost a dozen books. She's not only a professor and researcher, but also an activist who fosters equity, diversity, and inclusion in the wider academic and non-academic communities. In 2013, Dr. Bonifacio co-founded the Read World Foundation to support schools affected by disasters. She also co-founded the Support Network for Academics of Color Plus to promote racial justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion for students, staff, and faculty at the University of Lethbridge and beyond in 2015. In 2017 to 19, Dr. Bonifacio represented the racialized academic of the Equity Committee of Canadian Association of University Teachers. It is our great pleasure today to announce Dr. Glenda Bonifacio to this platform organized by Maple League host. Over to you, Professor Glenda. My pleasure to be with you uh, this day. And uh, I'm so glad to actually meet again online my, my graduate student who is now joining us in the academy as a professor at Acadia University. I am also grateful for the invitation from the Maple League Universities uh, through the leadership of Dr. Juan Carlos uh, Sanchez, uh, Lopez, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Juan Carlos Lopez, as well as to, you know, the, uh, the universities that covered in, in this instance. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, why, where you're able to get this information. <laughs> Perhaps it's available online, you know, about myself. So I don't have really much to say, but, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you. My, it's not a presentation, you know, at, at this time, it's more of a conversation. So I think my conversation will start off with a land acknowledgement. It's more of a land-based uh, approach now. So I am here in Thunder Bay, 
the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, the signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, as well as the Medi people. I consider myself a visitor to Turtle Island and I've enjoyed the benefits and privileges throughout uh, 18 years in Alberta and uh, over four months here in Ontario. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity again to kind of share. This is not a lecture. I, I kind of decided not to give a lecture. I think at this time, April 10 at 11.07 my time, is we have so many rich resources on equity. A number of them have already been a mainstream. You know, the advocacy and push has now with us. And it's just a step forward from many of us in different universities and in in particular offices to actually make it more meaningful. So my so my approach is more of a conversation with you. And I have a, I have only one slide. And the conversation really starts with uh, with with an approach that is more reflective. It's it's in a way a summation a partial summation of my engagement with equity work. So I call it living steps to equity and inclusive excellence. So, and maybe it may be the first time for you to hear, you know, some of my thoughts, or perhaps you may have heard my ideas somewhere, but I acknowledge that this is uh, from my coming from my heart. If I may share an idea similar to what you have read, we are on the same page. We are on the same plan. We are in the same space, you know, in that spirit. But uh, I like to kind of position my 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 conversation with you by sharing you these three points. I like to uh, check if you can see that. Are you able to see my one slide? This is different from what I normally do. I'm heavily on slides, but now, um, you know, it's coming from my heart. So it's more, more of a conversation to living steps for equity. And I have here three points to ponder. And the three points to ponder is the first is what I call multiverse personalism. The second kind of theme I'm going to draw on is doing, being, living with equity. And then the last uh, kind of set of ideas I'll share with you is uh, holistic excellence. So perhaps, uh, I, th I, I think you can still see me, but uh, I'll go back to the slide later on. But first I'll, I'll deal with the, what they call multiverse personalism. Multiverse personalism, I don't know if you have heard from this, but I, I kind of have it part of my, my signature as well as when I was at the other university about the, I have you know, parallel demands, you know, of different uh, demands of parallel universes. So in other words, we navigate multiverse, you know, our persona, our, our, be, uh, our you know, who we are, navigate these multiple uh, universes. So it's, I think, uh, true to all of us because, uh, you know, as uh, professors, as uh, workers, we are not only professors or workers, we are also mothers, we're also sisters, we're also, uh, you know, a daughter or a friend, or we have all of this, you know, for our students who we are. So we, navigate this multiple universe in our daily life. So to actually put us in a box to say that you are a professor from nine to four, and then you're a mother from four to seven, it doesn't work. So in other words, as human beings, we all have different uh, universes to actually work along to make our lives, you know, to kind of go through life. So my, in this multiple, what they call personalism, I'll touch it on with uh, 
with the evolution again of my engagement with equity work. And perhaps it started even before I knew it. And then reflecting back for this talk, I realized, you know, like when I was young, I kind of, maybe when I was younger, when I was then as a child, elementary, maybe I grew taller than the rest. So because I was taller than some of my peers, I got, I tend to kind of oversee uh, other kids fighting. So I kind of put myself in between. So I remember vividly, you know, like uh, I was, I, I was always in that position of kind of negotiating, you know, peace, you know, like, you know, you, you shut up, <laughs> you do this. And, and it was in elementary and then moving to high school in my country, in the Philippines, I was, uh, you know, I was voted the class monitor for four years in high school, like the uh, first of the fourth year. We didn't have the senior high school before. And what's the job of a monitor, class monitor? It's more of a, it's more of a, it's the alter ego of the teacher. So I was assigned to do the attendance, I chimed to all of this like an alter ego of a teacher. So uh, I, I didn't know why my, why my classmates voted me for the four years until graduation. <laughs> I was the alter ego of the teacher. So again, kind of putting in, in a spot where, where what could have been, what, what did I do, you know, like at that time. And then in the Philippines uh, at that time, we were required to do military, compulsory military training. And then uh, I went through training and I, I became one of the three female company commanders of, I have a, I was, uh, I was Delta company with four platoons. One platoon is equals to maybe over 40 students high school high school students so times four you know like maybe 120 plus the other staff and then it's a military training and then at the end of our one year military uh, compulsory training i didn't know i was voted the kindest company commander <laughs> so i like uh, you know in, in a position of power where all of you know you're co-equal, you're equal, but in a position of power under military training, uh, there's a lot of abuse and a lot of stuff going on. And in my heart, I didn't do that. So, you know, punishing, you know, my classmate or equal or my, my it's a combined school. So, and then of course I went to university and then I was, uh, yeah, I was the first female chair of the student council. And then I make a short, you know, I, I got engaged into volunteerism because of poverty and class issues. So I volunteered again to assist the students to be able to go to school. And then in a different environment, you know, I went to Australia for my PhD. And, uh, you know, race is a stark identity. So whereas in my country, it's more of, of class of you know a privilege because you have a stark contrast between the rich and the poor. In Australia, you have the realization, your awareness of your race. So consciousness when you leave the you know when you leave the your comfort zone, you know you realize that you are racialized. And uh, I and uh, you know my work on access and and for equity. You know, as a student and as a mother, you know, I brought my kids to Australia too. So, you know, kind of advocating for for fairness. You know, why my daughter has to be this? Why my daughter has to suffer this? So bullying before it became famous, you know, we already have experience by that. So anyway, I came to Canada and then the same, you know. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that Equity is is not a magic uh, kind of. It didn't happen to us on an instant. It's a, it, we live with that. We live with that, and finally find our voice. Finally, found a courage to actually share that in the public realm, and uh, in whichever space we kind of push or advocate, whether it's the principal's office whether in the grocery store, 
whether going to health service, there is this sort of a consistency, you know, like, and then you find yourself, you know, like you are experiencing all of this. And would it be different when you are now a professor? And then you realize that because you're racialized in Canada, in white settler societies like Australia, you realize that it's, it's still the same. So you go through different policies and procedures, you know, all of these things, teaching, evaluation, tenure process, you have to fight. In other words, every step of the way, we kind of have these barriers set to us. And it's simply by, uh, by race, all of those, you know. So in other words, um, when we when my co-founded Support Network for Academics of Color Plus, it's a realization that our society, you know, while we have pushed for that, it's inscribed in different policies. As a society, we need sort of a safe space so that all others would be able to kind of be able to live, you know, without that fear, without that anxiety. We, it's all volunteer work, no, um, no money involved. We only need the connection and the support you know, of others in collaborating for raising awareness. And, uh, and I realized that along the way, the work for indigenization, the work for truth and reconciliation, the work for equity has kind of been born by those who are affected most. So in other words, we are living, you know, the marginalization and the discrimination. At the same time, we are actually pushing so that the change will occur somehow, not for ourselves, you know, not for not in our time, but for the next one. So in other words, you are moving the steps so that you know when we engage, it's not for us, but you know, thinking about you know my children, thinking about you know the community. So it became a realization that when we move forward, we need each other. So the support network for academic of colors plus includes those who may not be racialized, but those who actually share you know, and, and recognize that for us to move forward, we need, we need each other. We need to work together. So, so in terms of migration you know, and all of the stuff that we work, uh, one of the symbolism that I share for groups you know, to understand you know, why we are in together, uh, it, has raised uh, some, some concerns, but uh, just for purposes of representation, I always say that, you know, in any society and in and in universities and in civilization, civilizations are, you know, <laughs> rise up, fell, and societies grow, you know, at the backs, and mostly at the backs of the vulnerable. So you have slaves, you know, you have women and, and others. So, in in terms of of looking at that in as a society, I always uh, present the the pie. So if the, if the society is the pie, or a university is the pie, so the, the apportionment of those pie is equivalent to an access to equity. So when you slice the pie, you know when you open the when you open the borders, when you open the seat for others to come in with diverse of uh, voices with diverse experiences, LGBTQ plus A, uh, people of color, you know, those with different sexualities, different religion. When you open that, that space, you have a much broader conversation, much richer conversation and much richer discussion because uh, we put together, let's say if there would be 20, diverse uh, opinions and diverse live experiences, we are all together learning about 20 lives in one instant. And, uh, and that's something that's not really, has not transcended beyond those who are like-minded, right? 
But we are, if we are in a room of also different people, the courage to speak is upon us. And then we just will start the first. I'm always happy that if I start a conversation this way and another colleague would support saying, I agree, you know, the burden is already lifted. You know, I don't have to do all the conversation. I don't have to, you know, all of this. And in the first place, it is not, you know, it's not my right to actually say, you have to do this, you have to learn about that. So each of us goes through those living steps to acknowledge that I have a role, I have a, what I call a shared accountability, like a shared responsibility to move forward. Anyway, so that's a, that's my multiverse personalism. In other words, you are a teacher, you know, you're a professor, you're a scholar, you're a researcher, you're also part you know, of, an, of, a, of, a, of a larger movement that uh, has come at this time. But if we are at this moment in our time, we need to recognize that, you know, there's also the struggle, the blood and the sweat of a hundred years or so, you know, depending on which struggle we, we take, you know, gender justice, climate justice, you know, decolonization has already been set, you know, by many in different parts of the world. And in Canada, we, we, we continue the struggle, we continue the, we continue the discussion and, and moving forward. So that's what they call a multiverse personalism. And um, in activism, I thought activism, in activism, we have this phrase, if not I, who, who will start it? Do I have to wait for maybe a next meeting, maybe next month, when you know that it needs to happen? So if not I, who? And if not today, when? And uh, you know, I also work in sociology of disasters, and we live on a borrowed time. So today, this moment will never pass. And tomorrow will be a different reality. Today we have our offices. Tomorrow, maybe because of disasters or something, we would have no offices. You know, maybe an uh, a missile would land in some other an other space. You know, today we are practicing, you know, doctors, dentists, next day you are a refugee. So our time, our moment in time is that time that we live. So if we live today, by 24 hours, my in my living step, uh, perhaps because they come from a different culture too, and different ways of understanding, you know, and, and different uh, uh, areas that I learned. It's something that they always look back and saying that there's 24 hours in a day. I have about perhaps maybe one second, one minute to smile, or maybe, you know, another an effort to actually make the space inclusive. The inclusive space doesn't mean that you say, welcome to my office, you know, welcome here. This is a, this is a safe space. The inclusive space is the space in which we animate. So, you know, like a smile, your smile brings freshness, brings warmth to somebody feeling not good because of some problems or whatnot. So we could actually extend you know, the warmth that we feel at that moment to people that we are interacting with. So that is, uh, so in, in terms of my own living steps and my conversation, uh, we learn it, you know, there are different concepts that, you know, I think you know that very well, but in terms of conversation with how we can actually move forward is, uh, is this way of trying to find um, trying to find sense of who we are, you know, as as individuals, as human beings, you know, all of those rights, uh, equal representation, the charter, they are a reminder that as human beings, we share the same space. And uh, if you feel that uh, 
I sh should not be treated this way, then we should not treat the other person that way. So I think it's part of a golden rule. So my, I'll, I'll go to the next, uh, so that we will have a more conversation. I'll go to the next uh, point, which is uh, my doing, being, living. So this doing, being, and living, it's more of a, what I say, trying to find, it connects with the first one, is trying to find consistency in what we do. Like doing are the activities that we engage in. We choose the activities that we do, like in terms of research. We choose the research that makes meaning to us. And in terms of teaching, you know, we may have a, a standard and a course, but we also choose how we design the curriculum, what to address, or what kinds of topics to, to focus on while at the same time providing the so-called skills that all students would do. And then what else? In terms of service. So we choose where we would like to provide our service as uh, as you know members of the of the university. And then in terms of the community. We also choose where we shop. We choose what to buy. We choose, you know, so all of those, uh, you know, kind of more of a consistency. What the, I find in my experience is that doing, being, and living kind of connects. So my research on gender migration connects with me because, you know, of gendered experiences of migration, then uh, because of disaster, um, my hometown, my home city in the Philippines was uh, flattened. 95% the city was flattened by uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda. So one day you have a house, you have your family, the next day your family is missing. And, you know, so your change, your life changes. So, and then I expanded my research to the sociology, to sociology of disasters and migration in the context of displacement and disasters. And that is only one po po point. And then the other is that disasters also occur in epidemic, in you know, you and war, et cetera. So you can find meaning in into what you do. So when you kind of find the meaning in terms of that, you add it into your living steps. So the day may, you know, so I don't equate eight hours, whatnot. So my colleague put 100% research, 100% teaching, 100% service. So you don't say 40% research, 40% teaching, and 20% service. Because in application of the multiverse, you know, our multiverse, we do 100% for a service, 100% for teaching, 100% for research. So I would encourage you to do that, and perhaps we can change how we view our service, how we do our research, and how we do our teaching, because all of those three are connected in universities. And even after our classes, you don't say, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, I'm a professor, after my, you know, only for my class. And after my class, I'm no longer connected with the university because I am now a, a private citizen. No, it doesn't work that way. Because doing, being, and living, as you know, we are as part of the university of the academy, we are in a in a privileged workplace, and a privileged workplace is a place where in Canada, for those who are in public, you know, institutions, the publicly funded institutions, we owe our service to the people. We are paid by by taxpayers, taxpayers including indigenous communities temporary foreign workers, international students. So all of those pay for Canadian tax. So our responsibility is not simply towards our teaching, towards our research, but rather we are, we are part of this special privileged workplace where transformation you know, of skills, a contribution to promoting social justice, you know, becoming better communities in the future is within us as students, as faculty and as staff. All of those, you know, create a positive learning experience for our students. 
we make or break the experience of our students in our classroom, among our staff. So it's not because, you know, uh, staff deals with this and I, I deal with that. Uh, we kind of put them all together. We add it all together. And that's the university experience. So whether we do a small role, a bigger role, you are the president, you are the dean, you are somebody in receiving, somebody in uh, the cafeteria, somebody in supply, somebody in the facilities, we all contribute to the total university experience. It's not simply because the president is there, the president is that, of course they have a role to play, but uh, kind of trying to empower everybody and kind of feel valued that what I do at the university, in universities, really contributes to providing the access, you know, equitable spaces for everybody, for everyone. And that kind of messaging has not been kind of set a stone. And for all of those in universities publicly funded, you know, we owe our salary to the people, not to the university. We owe our mandate, you know, uh, providing, you know, the best teaching experience. Of course, we have the Lakehead University, you have your university, but, uh, you know, we don't owe it, you know, our employment is not uh, premised on somebody else's uh, favor, but, you know, your, your merit to be able to provide that kind of experience with the uh, students. Okay, now, so that's what they call, you know, so in, my, in other words, the special, like a moral mandate of a principled work. So if all of us kind of, if we all have an idea about this, then, you know, equity work is shared. If uh, equity officers are not uh, magicians, that they provide all the answers and we simply follow, equity work is in all of us. And uh, equity is uh, kind of providing, you know, the a fair, a fair fairness or a level playing field. And if you are in reception, students and uh, student uh, registration or something, you know, we kind of have that uh, have that thing in, in our in our mind. The last thing so that we will have more conversation is uh, uh, what I call, um, I'll share it to you again, what I call uh, holistic excellence. Holistic excellence, I'm not sure if this has been uh, kind of discussed or a way, or you, usually we have inclusive excellence. The inclusive excellence starts with the requirement for research proposals by SHORT and NSERC and CHR. How are you going to you know, integrate you know, the EDI question? How are you going to make all of this? So inclusive excellence tends to be more in the research and then in teaching. How are you going to design your course so that you know you also acknowledge the contribution of non-Western, non, yeah, the, the kind of different ways of knowing, uh, indig indigenous ways of knowing, or alternative ways of, you know, of resources. How do you do that? How you find spaces? You know, um, that's that's in teaching and research, but. Uh, Inclusive excellence uh, in my experience and how I look at that now in terms of my personal, the political kind of nexus is really a holistic excellence. Holistic excellence is uh, in what we do uh, as a student, as a staff, as a professor, as a, as, a, as a leader or in whatever role. It's kind of trying to put forward that uh, this is something that is uh, connected to what we do. And holistic excellence kind of puts us in a, in a bigger scale. In other words, we find our space in, the, in that multiverse, in that, let's say, you know, in the universe, you, you're, we are a dot, you know, we are a dot in the universe. So we find our dot in the universe and in that dot in the universe, we, in in whatever knowledge that we have understood, in your own in our own little ways, we excel, because when we excel in what we do, whether we are a staff, faculty, or student, 
you know, the excellence of what we do, kind of like a sunshine, like the, it's like the eclipse. It, it, like, like it, it radiates to others. So it's in a way, it's an indirect way of changing, you know, the, our communities. So at this time, we are more, I think it is a, it's a more critical point in our time to be able to build that holistic excellence of trying to find the interconnectedness of who we are, what we do, and where do we want to go. So I think you're all familiar that we are in this existential crisis. We have global climate change, so you have the climate justice. And then recently, the European Union, the European courts, uh, European highest court decided, I think yesterday, that you know climate you know that uh, seeking i think it's part it's part of human right to actually live in a safe um, and uh, pollution whatever free environment so there's now after 10 years of of a legal proceeding they have that now so it's under climate justice but there are so many others working along the way and uh, and the question that really kind of puts us in a position of critical you know, existentialism is that as we, as we move forward for collaboration, there's always you know, a, it's a magnet for a backlash for backward. And as we move towards creating something, there's a, another thing of destruction. And so this is the importance of social science and humanities. So, and uh, you know, working across transdisciplinary realm you know, the sciences, you know, engineering. So in other words, when we kind of put ourselves together, connect, you know, our, our excellence together, we were able to provide a much holistic understanding of our world and what we could do. Not simply the, for example, climate science is a male, mostly dominated by male scientists, but the push for climate justice, you know, for action, are led by young people and women. So there's this kind of polarization about this, but not really a meeting point. And the university is the is the ideal place to kind of put all of those dots together. And then in, uh, yeah, so my, in terms of this is kind of my last uh, pitch already about holistic excellence is that uh, when we work, when we engage with equity work, trying to build inclusion and then, uh, you know, decolonization, indigenization, and so many of the mandates that we have to go through, we do not think of it as a siloed process. Equity, indigenization, decolonization is not siloed. They are part of that connecting the dots to actually ensure that, you know, what we, what will become of us in terms of the mentors would somehow be able to uh, open the path for these young leaders, our students, to create that pathway really of making the change to see a much better future for all. Thank you. Thank you for, for listening. So I think we could start the, the conversation if uh, you're interested to follow through. Thank you, Glenda. Um, um, the, the last point you were making, uh, and I, I will jump in and start uh, just by saying that 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 uh, identity piece, uh, I've you know I've been I don't know it's been like more than than twenty years since I got my PhD, and and I I was just reflecting that when I ask you know what who who are you or what do you do or where have you you know I will mention you know I'm a soil microbial ecologist because that's my area of research you know and I teach at this and that you know and a couple of years ago I was doing a, a, a an interview with with another teacher and she asked me a, a question on how does my area of research, my soil microbiome, she said, how does that connect, you know, the organisms that you work in? So how does that connect to, to your teaching? And she made me pause at that question. You know, I was, I had, she had sent me some of the questions she was going to ask me, but that she hadn't, right? 
And she asked me that. She said, well, you do this. You work with microorganisms. You know, you do. how does that connect with what you do? And she really made me pause. And I said, this is wonderful. Yes, of course it connects. You know, I work with these fungi that are uh, symbionts, you know, so they connect plants. And then I went on through the whole how uh, my research definitely in my mind, there was, it was a very clear path to me, you know, how, how that interaction of organisms uh, that was going underneath, you know, where you don't see uh, uh, with a, with a naked eye, right? Um, it's in the soil, right? How all that caused, you know, what what we see as a forest, right? And and I could see all those connections, you know. And uh, and to me, it's really important uh, to work together. You know, for me, it's you know, I I I have because of my research, I have deep understanding of the importance of those interactions and working together. And, and I'm particularly interested in what's called the friendly fungi, so mycorrhizae, so they, because they, they are symbionts, right? So you get, you, you have a, a positive interaction and that's what my research has been, you know, in my life. But, but uh, it, for me, it was very transformative when she asked me and I said, oh my goodness, you gave me permission to connect this wonderful world that exists in what's me, you know, and now uh, when I'm asked what I do or who I am, you know, I, I, I stop and I think it's like, well, yes, this is what I did for my training, but it, it is more than that. And I'm uh, starting <laughs> to, to, to try to understand that, that, uh, that relationship. So that, that really uh, uh, resonated with me. So, so thank you. Thank you for sharing. And um, I, uh, I, I will just open the floor and, and any thoughts uh, from anyone. Maybe I can I can uh, I can start asking a question. Um, yeah, just to want to know, Professor. Uh, so, what actually differences did you find in terms of your experiences being a professor long time, teaching, and in the position asking question to authority? Now you are in your dean, uh, and you are the authority to respond to the questions. The questions you would ask before, and what are the differences and challenging you challenges you find in in different positions? Thank you very much, Rabindra. And then you know, I just like to say thank you because uh, Rabindra, uh, when Rabindra started as a PhD student, and Rabindra was also a pioneer, like the founding member uh, of the support network for academics of Color Plus at the University of Lethbridge before. And um, and I think uh, throughout the three years or so of uh, the time at uh, in Alberta that we work uh, in in many ways, uh, you understood, you know, my advocacy, my kind of activism, um, in in the in that in that in that area. Since um, I think I mentioned this when I was uh, speaking at the CAUT Equity Conference that uh, during the time. You know, we were in between two walls, the wall of the administration and the wall of the faculty association. But at the time, the faculty association um, took off the equity language in a way saying that anyway, uh, there are rights, there are many laws about uh, protecting rights, human rights, so, so there's no need for the faculty association to kind of engage with that. So. So there was this kind of dual wall in terms of working for racial justice and um, and support for academics of color and racialized faculty. So that was my so when I started at uh, the previous university, you know, having this sort of a concept of of holistic, you know, of who I am. So when I started, you know, I it was different from what they have. I engage the community, I engage my class to the community. So I hold my class sometime in the public library so that my class would have a dialogue with the community. So I open my my activities uh, in my class if we have to others, you know, from students, from anybody to kind of a public discourse. So it was uh, something new at that time over 18 years ago. 
And uh, so I just felt, you know, what I have to do, how I design a course. So I have academic freedom. So I'm, you know, I was true to that principle. So I went on and on and on and on. So anyway, and I, uh, you know, like most of you, you're part of committees and all that. And then, so I believe in what I teach. So, you know, I th and I, I thought that with general women studies and, uh, and I handled long time ago, I have other courses too. So it's more about what we believe, you know, what we teach about justice, what we teach about this. And then here we are, we cannot, we cannot do, we cannot do anything like, but we can do something, you know. So all of those kind of little steps that, those voices that we raise, you know, part of the conversation, though it's hard because uh, you are emotionally, it's like, a, it's like li doing, living and being because that topic is, is really you, it's a lived experience. You kind of, come out very strong <laughs> you come out very strong and then especially you know like when at the moment you know in that meeting you kind of very strong so uh which you don't want people to be offended but because uh the topic is so strong maybe they have a different reaction but you know so i was consistent in i believe i was consistent in my classroom and and if i'm a member of a committee you know on outside so i was consistent you know so that that consistency is there, you know. Like if if I had to speak up because uh, it have to, I speak up, and I think about the consequence after. <laughs> so, or I do this and uh, anyway. So it's all the moment, and then and now you know as uh, I I'm into my role. I'm into my over four months as dean at the, at Lakehead University, Social Science and Humanities, and. Uh, I don't feel anything. I'm just the same. So it's a it's a different role, but now you have kind of more perhaps influence because it's just the faculties here, and then you are the dean, you're in between. So you are for a faculty, and then you're then you move towards administration, you're in between. So it's important that the dean understands the faculty. The dean understands, you know, the vision, you know, where the faculty, you know, would like to move forward and then raise and you know, bring that to administration. And then with administration, I feel that you have the voice, you have one voice. So as a dean, you have one voice to actually present, you know, your ideas, you know, to kind of align with the faculty, you know. So in terms of, so for me, um, it's just like if I'm in the first step, you know, as a faculty, I'm on the second step as dean, but nothing changed. I don't, you, you have 18 years, you know, of your life in the university. It doesn't change because you got a new role. You're still the same. But the conversation has, has moved in a different level. But at the same time, you also need to have a conversation with students, with faculty. So perhaps when I arrive, I think uh, I connected with the student union, with the, I set a meeting with the uh, student union representative to hear about their voices, about social science and humanities, about the faculty. And according to the student, it was the first time that uh, they talked with the dean, had a dialogue with the dean. So it's uh, like what I did when I was still uh, a faculty, you know, it's still the same. Like, it's my feeling is the same, but perhaps in uh, in in those negotiation of this sandwich position allows you to kind of represent, you know, the voices of the faculty, <clears throat> and then if that voice, you know, that voice should be heard in, at the table, <clears throat> and whether that voice is carried forward, at least you're able to raise an awareness. So. You know how we move forward. It's that doesn't happen. You know, at an instant. There's a, as the university we have processes in place. So and all of those processes, the faculty is engaged. So I encourage the faculty to use those processes to have their voices be heard. 
you know, raise the voice because when you raise the voice, it's an exercise of academic freedom as well. You know, it's an exercise of collegial governance. If you don't hear that voice, you would you would in the in my experience, like in my previous university, that you become the voice. You feel that you become the voice, and then the people could just say agree, disagree. But in our different processes, different committees, in terms of providing you know, equity programming, uh, inclusive practices, uh, steps towards decolonization, or how we indigenize the academy, it is not uh, taking away you know, your privilege, but rather just being part of the pie, you know, just being part of the whole picture. So, and others kind of feel, oh, they got this, you know, what about us? It's not anymore, what about us as, as a separate group? But what about us as the whole? So in all of those uh, spaces, now that I am Dean, I, I st I'm still the same. Um, my idea, so I, I I represent, I share my voice. So I may be the maybe the only critical voice, but I I say what I have in my heart and in my mind. You know, on the benefit of students and the faculty of the and, and faculty in my faculty. So you bring it forward, you know, because you have all of different competing interests, and um, yeah, and and I and I think I would encourage, you know. Uh, people, many of women and racialized faculty and students, to engage in leadership positions, in because it's not per se the leadership rather, but the opportunity to be able to contribute and transform the discourse. Because once we transform the discourse, so, uh, some action will happen, either policy or change, and a policy. Or, or what we aspire to change will not drop, will not uh, miraculously drop in our hands. We have to work for it. And when we work for it, we have to work together to achieve that. And working together, there are different, you know, resistance, but it's part of the, it's part of the process. And then, yeah, according to one earlier, listen, listen, learn, listen, listen, learn. And then when you do listen and learn, then you'll find yourself, you have a voice. You don't simply listen and learn anymore, but you can also speak about what you listen, what you have learned. And then others who might also be in a, in a similar journey also would listen and listen and learn. And then have the courage you know, to actually speak. It's not your voice per se, but a collective voice from your uh, knowledge coming from different, yeah, coming from different areas. Yeah, so that's, uh, so to answer your question, Rabindra, in simple terms, uh, even though I may be Dean, I'm still Glenda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions or comments from the our audience. Perhaps one thing I'll, oh, okay, Shati would like to share something. I have a, yeah, just, um, I want to say thank you for, for all you've shared. And I did have a question. Um, I think you named earlier how a lot of the work that is happening for moving these Moving these things forward comes from folks who are marginalized in different ways, right? Whether we're racialized or we're um, on the margins because of our gender or ability or sexual orientation. And to me, that makes a lot of sense because being on the margins, you can see more, you have a wider field of vision, right? Um, and we're advocating for them. And what I'm curious about in your in your years in in academics, and um, whether you you've come across or helped design or put into place processes for accountability that invite but also hold people like you know other people people who are in positions of privilege not just because of their you know because they're employed by the academy but if you're privileged based on your race on your gender on your you know all of those things 
we know, like the research is very clear about who's doing this work, right? Who's back this work is happening on. And so I'm curious about how we shift that, right? How do we make this something that we're holding? Obviously we have our role, which you named so, and so beautifully and articulately around using our voices and how do we make that a more shared responsibility? And I'm curious if you yeah, had had ways in which you put that into place that um, holds people who don't necessarily have that field of vision and have to commit to doing that work. How do we how do we create those structures of accountability in academia? Yeah, that's a very good question, you know. And then I think my I said earlier about you know university as a kind of privileged workspace. So we are, you know, we we are responsible for transforming and shaping the minds of, of young people who become leaders, you know, of tomorrow. And then in Canadian context, you know, most of our universities are publicly funded. And um, this sort of entitlement, you know, like, okay, that uh, there's uh, there's this uh, idea of entitlement, like when you become a professor, uh, you become above the rest, you know, of humanity, you know, like when you become a professor, you know, there, it, it's, not, uh, it's not an excuse not to be human. <laughs> When you become a professor, it's not an excuse, you know, to be mean to students, you know, to be to be mean to the staff, to the faculty, you know, like when you become a professor, it's it's uh it's the work that you do that you become a professor. And it's not because you know you are a human being. So the the idea that you know when we when we become when we are part of a university, especially in, in those publicly funded universities. We exist because of the people, because of our students, of those students in our hope. We also exist not only for our students, but rather for everybody in our society and everybody in the province, everybody in Canada that pays taxes. So everybody, international students pay tax, temporary foreign workers pay tax, indigenous people also pay tax, you know. They also pay tax if they work outside, you know, of the reserves. So they 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 pay tax. There are very few who only work within the particular areas of the reserve. So if we actually raise, you know, that awareness and consciousness that we are paid, you know, by people's money, we are accountable to the people. I am not accountable to my professional association. I'm not accountable to, you know, my my degree. I'm accountable because you know my privileges, my the benefits that I have today is because of some other people, some other sweat from the backbone of each and every one of those who pay tax. So <clears throat> if we have that understanding, then we would have a shared responsibility of actually treating students who look different better, you know, than what we uh, I, I think I remember. Uh, Rabindra's exercise of collecting a live experience of how many of the staff would treat him well or not. Remember, <laughs> you, it, it was a joke that you had with the other international students, you know. So, and and in in that sense, you know, like uh, if we have that idea that you know our bread and butter is the people, is the student, we would have a shared responsibility and a shared accountability of making that space better for everybody. Because uh, when you go out, you know, when you look at a, a, a person, you know, who was different from the mainstream, they do contribute to our pay. They do contribute to our salary. So, but we don't think that way. I'm not sure if you have heard it from, from others, but, uh, that's how I that's how I view it in terms of shared accountability. And then when you become president, the more that you actually have the responsibility to show that all of the money that you know the university has to spend, you know, is accountable, accounted, and then going for better programming, you know, and more of a, a conscious mindset. So yeah, and then even if we do get, you know, our short money, our short research funds, it's still people's money. And then when we get the funding, you know, for research, for for others, it's still it's not our money. It's people's money. It's, it was just channeled to short. It was just channeled to encircle. 
or channeled to CIHR. The government money is people's money and we pay for it. And everybody here, whether they are refugee, whether they're international students, again, whether they are temporary foreign workers, they pay tax. So each time, you know, they buy food, they pay tax. And, you know, even for undocumented, so-called, they, they still pay tax. And then, you know, our pension is also brought forward and maintained by taxes. So, and if we do not connect our being into the larger, larger systems, that's uh, kind of hard to have that uh, challenging idea of shared accountability in the university. But I think we should start from that mindset. Thank you. So uh, Cherry, we lost Cherry's <laughs> the connection, but this is recorded. So uh, being conscious of the time, we're uh, two minutes past the hour, so I'm going to stop the recording now. I don't know how much more time people uh, have to stick around, but uh, but I'll just uh, stop the recording. And thank you, thank you for your thoughts and your participation. I'm not going to close the call, but I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah, okay, thank you. And, uh... Yeah, thank you.